Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. You've got gifts from God. And uh, actually, as I was, as I was, uh, we were worshiping God, that, uh, you know, sometimes you, uh, with this how God works with me. Now, I've been doing this now about, I'll be 36 years this summer since I preached my first sermon. So I preached a few <laughs> over the years. And uh, here lately, God, God gives me a starting place and we just go. Now that for me is a little scary, you know, because I like notes and I like to have all that. But then again, uh, we want to we want to head the direction God wants us to head. Is that right? Amen. So if you would, I want you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter one. Ephesians, the first chapter. And let's get in the Word of God and see see what what He has to say to us here. How many of you know the Holy Spirit's the great teacher? you're born again you got the spirit of God on the inside of you and uh, he's there to teach us lead us and guide us into all the truth so that's what we're trusting today that, that we're going to be led into the truth right yeah. praise the Lord here in Ephesians chapter 1 I'm so uh, this this in fact this term uh, of the school year I'm teaching this the book of Ephesians to our students and really enjoy this uh, this this section of scripture, probably Ephesians, one of my favorite, my favorite, you know, I heard Nathan say something, my favorite ver- phrase in the Bible is, but God, there's no doubt about it. I mean, you, everything, you can talk about all, th- all the things the devil's tried to do in your life, has done in your life, and all the, you know, I, I tell people, that, you know, well, I was born on the tracks, on, you know, around the tracks, west side of the tracks, east side, north side, south side, but God. It doesn't matter, all that doesn't matter. Once you get to but God, everything that happened in the past is over. Hallelujah. Isn't that right? Yeah. Praise the Lord. Yeah. But God, you know. It, well, you know, uh, you know, that runs in my family. But God, I got a new family now. Amen. I have a hard time, you know, if I ever do have to go to the doctor filling out those, uh, mm-hmm. filling out those uh, uh, family history things. Because yeah. yeah. I'm thinking, my, my, in my family, there's no cancer in my family. There's no diabetes in my family. There's nothing... I'm in the family of God, but you know, they don't, they're not that concerned there about your spiritual family. <laughs> so it's kind of hard, you know, okay. And thank God for doctors, right? Yeah, right. We, we thank God for them and they, they help us out. They, they are on the same side as we are. I found this out though with, med- with medicine and different things of that sort. You know, uh, the doctors tell you the facts yeah. as they see them. Isn't that right? And that's, you know, a lot of times you see the facts. And when you, let's, Let's, you know, even something even more than doctors. You know, you look at your bank account, that tells you the facts of what you've got in your account. But there's something greater than facts, because you know facts change all the time. Now, to help me out here today to stay on time, I've got this clock. You see this clock right here? Now, I want you to notice something. The fact of what time it is changes every second. See that? Now, if you can break it down further, it changes faster than that. But for our sake, every second, the fact of what time it changes, uh, time changes. So that tells me this, facts are subject to change. That's right. But the truth never changes. That's right. Now, the, here's what I found out, and God's word is the truth. And you say, well, Jesus said, you remember John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the lie. Remember what Hebrew said about him? That he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's a great definition of truth. Amen. Something that's the same yeah. yesterday, it's the same today, it'll be the same tomorrow. It's never going to change. I found this out over the years. The application of the truth will change the facts. Now, it has to be consistent. You have to consistently apply the truth. And as you consistently apply the truth of God's Word, it will change the facts. Whatever the facts are in your life right now. You don't, I mean, and if it's good, it can get gooder. If, you know, if that's a word, that's not a word. But, but you, know, you know what I'm saying? If my wife was with me, she's, she's a school teacher. That, that doesn't work, you know. I can't say those things if she's with me, but anyway. <laughs> Did you find Ephesians 1? I hope so. Paul prays here, and this is a prayer we can pray for any Christian. The book of Ephesians and the New Testament is written to the saints and to the faithful. 
And, uh, you know, you can't take the New Testament and apply it to the sinner, folks. I just I hate to... I hate to bring that, that up, you know. It's popular today to take these scriptures and apply them to everybody, and it's just not the case. If you're not in Christ, it doesn't apply to you. All right? And if you're not in Christ, you're going to hell. That's just all there is to it. And, I, I, you know, it's not, it's not, it's really, that's not bad news. That's good news because there's a way out. Remember, but God. <laughs> okay? You don't have to go. I got it. It's like God said in Deuteronomy, I've set before you life and death. Choose life. You know, it gives you a hint, okay? <laughs> How many of you like to have the answers to the test before you get yeah. take the test? He said, here's the test. Life or death? Choose life. <laughs> All right. So in verse 17, Paul says, I, he's been praying that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, will give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, and there's three things here that he says he wants us to know by revelation, to know intimately, to know not just to be acquainted with, but to know, now I've also got, I'm, I'm kind of double-minded today, I've got my watch on and I've got that clock running, but this watch, I know how to set the time on it, you know, I know it to an extent, but you know there's somebody that knows this watch. In other words, if you took this watch apart, okay, how many of you, when you were a kid, you liked to take things apart? But were you like me, when you put them back together, you had leftover parts, something happened. It's like, wait a minute. But <laughs> why? You didn't know what you took apart. There's somebody that can take this apart, put it back together, and it works. If it's, if it's broken, they can fix it. They know the watch. And that's the way we're supposed to know these things, that we can take it apart, put it back together, and make it work. Well, the very first one, we're not going to cover, I, we don't have time to, I just want to talk about one of them today. What is the hope of his calling? Now, Bible hope is not I wish. It's part, there's part, there's a partial there, but Bible hope is confident expectation. Now, and it, 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 it is the future. It is future. What we, and there's certain things concerning our redemption we're yet hoping for. We haven't, we're hoping for the resurrection of our body. We have faith that it's going to happen, but it's based on the promise of God. Now he says, what is the confident expectation of, now notice what it says, the kingdom says it the right way, I believe, his calling. What is the confident expectation, in other words, what is God confidently expecting from the calling he's placed on your life? We're supposed to know that. To me, it's the saddest thing in the world for a Christian to get born again and not know what God wants them to do. I don't believe that's God's will. And in fact, Paul prayed. He said, I'm praying this for you all the time. Now, you know, we can take these prayers, we can pray them for one another, we can pray them for ourselves. What is the hope, the confident expectation? Now, Jeremiah 29, 11, what's that say? For I know the thoughts I think towards you, saith the Lord. Not, not of evil, but of good. To give you, one translation says an expected end, but others say a future and a hope. So God has, has a confident expectation. Now, what's a calling? The calling of God is a divine invitation from God, or a divine summons, if you will, to participate in the kingdom of God. We're just not supposed to be in the kingdom. We're supposed to be part of it, an active part of it. Each and every one of us has a part. Now, look over here in Ephesians chapter 4. You and I, this... This whole thing works as you and I do our part. Now, we're all part of the body of Christ universally, but yet we're, God has put, placed us in the body of Christ and it has pleased Him, and that means we're, we should be part of a local body somewhere. And ev every local body is a little bit different than any other part because we're all different. You know, your body has no cell that's the same. They're all different. Of the billions of cells in a human body, every one of them is different, not one exact. And so we're, we're that way, our, our, we're that way individually, we're that way as churches. But we all have a part to play. You know, this, if we could ever all get us all together, what a powerful group of Christians would be. But right now, we're not there. I believe we're going to be there because Jesus prayed that we'd be one. But I want you to see verse 1, Ephesians 4. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you. In other words, he, he said, I'm going to give strong a desire here that you would walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. Now, uh, the King James used the word vocation. It's actually the exact same word 
it could be translated, and some modern translations do, worthy of the calling wherewith you are called, with all lowliness of meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Now listen, don't ever let your calling, don't ever let your calling be a, po a point of strife. Now how does it become a point of strife? Because verse, because you don't practice verse 2, you're not humble. That's what he's talking about there. Some people, you know, bless their hearts. They spend all their time talking about who they are, and I'm this, and I'm that, you know. Well, I'm the dean of Rhema. Well, whoop-de-doo. You, you wouldn't be the dean of anything if it wasn't for God. So let's just give him all the credit and all the glory, right? You understand what I'm saying? And let's, and let's work with one another. The endeavoring to keep, that means it's going to take action. It's going to take action. Now, why is that? Verse 4, there is one body, one spirit, even as you are called. Here again, he says it, in one hope of your calling. I'm going to tell you right now, God does not have plan B for you. There is no plan B for your life with God. He has a plan. And if you're, if you're really ever going to be fulfilled, if you're ever going to do a, a, a be to that place to where you're satisfied with life, because we're supposed to live a long life and be satisfied, you're going to have to be in God's plan. He has a purpose. Now, here's the thing about God. God knows more than we do. Aren't you glad? You know. And God is able because He is the beginning and the end. I was, uh, I was uh, in my car one day, and I was thinking, and I, this came out of my mouth. I said, God, I thank you that you know the beginning from the end. And down on the inside, I heard the voice of, my, of the Spirit of God speaking to me and said, you, you quoted that wrong. I said, what do you mean? He said, I don't know the beginning and the end. I am the beginning and the end. And that's different. Okay? And he was able, God has been able to make a plan and a, a confident expectation for your life and call and calling in your life, knowing every mistake you would ever make in life. And yet he still has a confident expectation. One other aspect of that hope is it also carries with the idea there's joy involved in it. God, God is glad you're in the body of Christ. Okay? You ought to be glad that other members are in the body of Christ, that we're not alone. Paul said, I give thanks for you, making mention of you in these prayers. Well, that brings me to Exodus 18. I want you to go back there. How many of you have ever heard of Moses? Kind of a guy that's known, you know. Don't know if he looks like Charlton Hester or not, but... <laughs> That puts a little age on, age on some of us, right? You know. Maybe even, you know, Prince of Egypt is old now. Yeah. That's been out a long time. You know, the cartoon. Yeah. But here, uh, here Moses. Now Moses has got a, a, a pretty big time calling on his life. To be the one whom God used, an individual, and through his family to bring about the deliverance of the people of Egypt or Israel out of Egypt and really he's the probably the first pastor that we see in the Bible and he's got uh, a lot of Bible scholars put it at over two million people that he led out of Egypt that's a pretty good sized church especially for your first church and, uh, uh, <laughs> Moses's father-in-law now, this is just after, in chapter 17, you know, Joshua's fighting the battle and Aaron and her are holding up Moses' hands. And that's a great picture, you know, of, of helping and that type of thing. But then Moses' father-in-law shows up here. And uh, he, he, Jethro, yeah, he's watching. He's watching uh, uh, what Moses does and how he does ministry. And he's also himself a priest of God. He, he has a relationship with God. And here he becomes the mouthpiece of God. And I want to pick up in verse 13 of Exodus 18. Because we're going to bring this about, and I, you said, well, I'm not Moses, but we're going to bring about uh, an idea here for you this morning to get you started on a path towards something that I think is going to be a great blessing in your life and will be a great blessing in this church. And it came to pass on the, the, mor on the morrow. Now, I'm going to take the these and thous out as I go, okay? All right. And Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood by Moses from the morning until the evening. And when Moses, his father-in-law, saw all that he did, now notice that it says, to the people. He said, what is this thing that you do to the people? Why do you sit yourself alone and all the people stand by you from morning into evening? And Moses said to his father, because the people come to me to inquire of God. 
When they have a matter, they come to me, and I judge between one another, and I do make them know the statutes of God and His laws. So here, get this picture. We've got two million plus people, probably. They've got problems. I mean, if you know, if you run into one other person during the day, you've got a chance for problems. Have you found that out? I mean, so we've got two million people. They're out. It's hot out there. Thank God for the pillar of cloud by day. It's cold at night in the desert. Thank God for the pillar of fire at night. So they're out there, and they've just had great victory that God's brought them through the, you know, through the, uh, the sea, and, you know, they got there, then they didn't like what they had to eat, and God fed them, and just all kinds of things. They're griping and complain about everything. And so now, Moses is sitting there. From, the more, from sun up to sun down, okay? Have you ever been to a place where you have to take a number? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Getting weight? And so this is exactly, yeah, the DMV, oh, boy. This is worse than the DMV because at least they got it there inside. This, he, you, you, could, you have to get there early, probably before the sun comes up because he's only there from sun up to sun down and stand there all day and wait. Now what Moses is doing, he's, the, he's telling people what God's Word says. I mean, he's, he's the mouthpiece of God. He's sharing God's Word with them. But Jethro says you're doing it to the people. Now, ministry is not something you do to people. You do it for people to help. Now, look at verse 17. And Moses' father-in-law said unto him, The thing that you're doing is not good. First time I read that, it hit me right in the face. I thought, how could you ever tell anybody that was telling somebody else what God's Word had to say about their situation, how could you ever tell them what you're doing is not good? It wasn't the word he was sharing, it was how he was doing it. Okay? His, Moses' total leadership paradigm, or paradigm for those of you that... <laughs> or like me that thought that's how that was said when you first heard it. Saw it, when you first read it, paradigm, what is that? <laughs> I was reading in a book, I had to get a dictionary out. I asked my wife, what's this paradigm? She just laughed, fell over. <laughs> like, paradigm. Okay. Only the English language. Then it should have been D-I-M-E, dime, <laughs> not D-I-G-M. Anyway, but his whole way he did ministry changed that day. Now here's what Jethro says, verse 18. You will, sh you will surely wear away, both you and this people that is with you. For this thing is too heavy for you, you are not able to perform it yourself alone. Now, there's, there, right there, you and I just got mentioned in the church. Because when God tells someone who's in leadership, you can't do it alone, He's already provided ahead of time those to help do the job. All right? Now, you may not see them yet, and they may not be where they're supposed to be yet, but He's already, he's already provided. So now, He's talking about... And so. I'm reading this, 2000, back in 2002, I'm getting ready to go to our school in Columbia. And they asked me, he wanted me to come down and teach on uh, biblical leadership. You know, and he said, no, I don't want you to read a book and bring it down and come to, he said, well, there's enough books on leadership and they're just, he's bring the, you know, find out what the Bible says about it and come on down here. So I'm reading this. And as I'm reading this, I'm, I'm seeing, I'm starting to see it from a different standpoint because, uh, one of the great, to me, my greatest desire would be if I can help you stand before the Lord someday and hear the phrase, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. Then I'll be in that crowd. I'll be one of the ones cheering for you out there. Because that's, that's what God has called me to do, is to help people do what God called them to do. All right? And the way I do that is through teaching that type of thing. But... He said, start looking at this, not from Moses' standpoint, but for the ones Moses is going to be looking for. All right? I had to title this message today. It's Get Ready, Moses Needs Help. Now, let's go on here. Verse 19. He says, hearken to my voice. Listen, I'll give you counsel and God will be with you. You be for the people to Godward that you may bring the causes to God. And you shall teach them ordinances and laws and shall show them the way wherein they must walk and the work that they must do. Now, in verse 20... You see, in, in one verse, you, th you see the three steps to developing leadership right there. Number one, teach them. Number two, model it in front of them. And number three, let them do it then. Very simple. He shows him right there. Now, up to this time, who's doing all the ministry? 
Moses, doing it all by himself, right? All by himself. Now verse 21. Moreover, you shall provide out of all the people, able men such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place them over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, rulers of tens. Now here's where, here's where I started to see something right here in verse 20. Well, here's where it really came clear to me. Moses is told by his father-in-law, by the Spirit of God, to look for people that had four characteristics. Four characteristics. Number one, they had ability. See that, able men? They had what kind of ability? Not natural, God-given ability. God-given ability. We don't have time to go. There, there's so many scriptures in the New Testament. The first Peter chapter 4 talks about it. As each one has received the gift. Now the word gift there is the word charisma. Now charisma is not just a magazine, okay? It's, it was actually a, it's actually a word that, that is used in the word of God by the apostle Paul. And it's that endowment from God. The root word is charis, C-H-A-R-I-S, which is the word for grace in the New Testament. That's the word, all right. What is grace? Grace is God's ability that helps us do what we couldn't do in and of ourselves. So this charisma is not natural ability. Now, it may seem like to you it's natural to you, but it's not natural. If you look around and see other people, and they can't do something that comes natural to you, you know it has to be God. Amen. Right? Now, how many of you this morning, you could not play the guitar? You can't do it. Why? You don't have the gift. Now, you can teach yourself a little bit, but then there are people that are gifted. It's obvious they have a gift. We see it musically more than we do in other areas. Well, you see it in preachers, too. It's obvious some people. I see it a lot at school. Let's just, let's just put it that way. They're Christians. God loves them, and they're going to do great, but they're not preachers, all right? And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong. The majority of the people that have graduated from Rhema are not pulpit ministers. The majority of them. You know, of the 28,000 that have graduated from there, you know, about, you know, maybe 10, 15, 15 percent, 20 percent are preachers. The rest of them, you know, are, should be great helps in their churches and great Christians and great business. I mean, they should be if they're applying what they learned. Okay. So able people, able men. Number two, they have a reverence for God. They fear God. Now, these are characteristics they were already supposed to have. That's why God said to me, get ready. Moses needs help. Because when, when Moses, whoever the leader is, comes and is looking for people, he's, he's told him, these people already have these characteristics. Look for them. Number three, people of truth. Now, when I think of truth, I think of that in a couple different ways. Number one, they have integrity. They're, they're true to their word. And number two, they're people of the truth, which is the word. They have the word. You say, well, you know, Pastor's just looking for somebody to help park cars. You need to be full of the word to park cars at a local church. I'm going to tell you right now. Because Christians will run you over in Jesus' name. Because that's their park. That I claim that parking spot. Get out of my way. I'm going to park there. Who are you to come against my faith? You're the, you turn into the devil. You're just trying to help people. and They, they think you're the devil because you, you won't let them park there. <laughs> Come on now. Yeah. So, uh, uh, but, <laughs> but, but every Christian should, should be, have a knowledge of the Word of God. And then, hating covetousness. Now, remember, these folks are about ready to be put in position to where they, they're going to make decisions. But, you know, every one of us need to hate covetousness. Now, you say, what does that mean, hate covetousness? I was, I was just really looking at this and began to study the, the, the idea of covetousness and the Word of God. And in this situation and in ministry, I found out over the years, that means this. You can't be bought. You don't have a price. In other words, there's nothing the devil could offer you. There's nothing the person could offer you to make you go against what God's Word says. You're going to do the right thing no matter what. You hate covetousness. Now, if you don't think people, now I was, you know, uh, I've never been a senior pastor, but I've been in local church ministries nine years, the first, my first church I worked at, six and a half years, the other, and this is my eighth year as being an associate pastor there at Rama. And if you don't think people will try to buy you, you don't know people. Okay? And you have to, it has to be something. Now, here's the thing about hating something. 
The Bible, the Bible talks about, well, look at, uh, look at Proverbs chapter 8 for just a moment. Do you realize this? You, you will have nothing to do with what you hate. You ever thought about that? And what you hate, you can't be tempted by. Now, I usually don't tell this story but it, but, but at the, uh, to the students, but I'll tell you all. And you guys will remember this. I hate hate out of a can cooked spinach <laughs> all right can't be tempted by it now i like just you know spinach that you put on a salad or i like spinach dip you know all that but that stuff now here's why when i was in grade school all right on the uh, in those days if you got the hot plate you know at lunch they would put spinach on there. And the rule was, you had to try a bite out of everything off that plate, or you couldn't go out for recess. Now, up until this time, I could get, I could take some spinach, I could eat some spinach. But one day, and your whole table, I mean, the table of kids sitting there, they all had to try, this, this very perceptive lunch lady had noticed that the guy sitting across from me had not taken a bite of his spinach. And he said to her, now he'd moved it around, you know, but she was watching him. And he said, yeah, he was a great repositioner, but it didn't, didn't work. And she, she said, you have to take it. He said, I, will, I can't do it. It makes me sick. No, she said, he said, no, you don't understand. I will throw up. Oh, no, you won't. You know, she knew more than him. So she said, here's what you do. Get, you, get some on your fork. And she made him, she waited until she got a, whatever satisfied her. Got it on the fork, and she said, now this, put it in your mouth and then take a drink of your milk real quick and swallow it down, you'll be fine. And we're all like, hurry up and eat, we want to go outside for recess. Well, did I mention he had chocolate milk that day? And so, he takes the spinach, puts it in his mouth, drinks the chocolate milk. And so now, we're not so concerned about recess, we want to know what's going to happen here. And so, of course, he starts, I'm sitting right across and he starts, you know, he starts, then... Out came the spinach and the chocolate milk. And I, I learned a biology lesson that day, an anatomy lesson that day. I didn't know that your mouth and the, that, that passage there is connected to the nasal passage here. Because out of his nose was dangling a little piece of spinach <laughs> dripping with chocolate milk. I hate, you can't tempt me with canned spinach. I will not know. All right. Now, Proverbs chapter 8. You guys, you guys remember that story, right? You never forgot it, have you? As soon as I started, I could see him. Oh. I love to tell that right before lunch at school. All right, verse 13, Proverbs 8. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. See, notice here, reverencing God here. To reverence God. To have God in, all, to have God in His right place. Now, I'm not afraid of God's punishment, but, of, but reverence for God. is to hate evil. Pride and arrogancy and the evil way in the forward mouth. Do I hate? See, God hates these things. The fear of the Lord is really to love what God loves and hate what God hates. Now, what does God love? People. So I never can get away with hating people, and I don't want to try. I want to love people. But he says here, it's to hate evil. Well, to hate covetousness means that you, you can't be tempted by it. Until you learn to hate that, it, the devil will use it against you in life. Come on. See, some people, some people, they, they don't hate what God's delivered them out of. Oh yeah, come on. And they, and they have opportunity to return there. Interesting scripture in Hebrews chapter 11. In fact, turn over there. Since you brought it up, you better, we better turn over there and look at it. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 11. Remember, God told, what did God tell Abram? Get away from your family, get away from your country, and go to a land that I'm going to show you, right? And uh, Abram left. Now, he took Lot with him, which he shouldn't have done, but that, that's a whole other story. But here, uh, look at verse C. Verse 13, Hebrews eleven thirteen. 13. These all died in faith, 
not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were persuaded of them and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. Now look at verse 15. For truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out. See, I don't even think about spinach. Yeah, it never crosses my mind unless I'm going to tell that story. I don't even think about it. Why? I mean, I don't even think about spinach out of a can. Don't even, doesn't, no. But see, what you don't hate, you, you'll think on. And he says, if they had been mindful of that country they came out of, they, have, they might have had opportunity to have returned. You see, if God's delivered you from alcohol, you can't think about alcohol. You start thinking about alcohol, you'll have opportunity to go back to that life. And alcohol, and I've seen it. I've seen ministers that God, I've seen them get involved in stuff. You think, what in the world happened? They, they, didn't, they didn't hate it. And they, they started entertaining it in your mind. And they had opportunity to return to that. Now, just because you think about something doesn't mean you sin, but you've got to know what to do with your thought life, right? You've got to take authority over that. Hold it up to what the Word of God says. You know, you know, boy, that, boy wouldn't it be good to have a beer today. But God, see, look at that through that, has delivered me from it. You understand what I mean? But see, the more you play with stuff like that, the, the, you're going to get yourself in a position you don't want to be. So, we can all work on those things, those four areas. The ability God's given you. You say, well, I don't know what that ability is. Well, I, 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 it, well, I can look around and say, yes, there are people in here that are at least my age. I'm 55, and I remember driving vehicles that didn't have power steering. You remember? We had a, we grew up, I grew up on the, uh, our, my dad's family were farmers, and so we, ended up, we still had some farming to do when I was growing up. We had an old pickup truck. Had a steering wheel about this big, right? Because it didn't have power steering. It had a knob on it. Because right. if right. you're going to turn that thing, boy, you had to take that knob and turn that thing, all right? But if that thing was sitting still, you, I mean, you're not turning that steering wheel. You get it going, get it, get it going, you can turn it a little bit easier. It's still tough. I'm a, you say, well, I don't know what God's called. I don't know what the gift's got. Well, I mean, let me tell you this. Get involved. Do something. Amen. Do something. And those gifts will come out. You'll find out real quick. You know, listen, if you can't make two and two equal four, you're not gifted to run the church finances. I'm going to tell you that right now. That's not your gift. Okay? You understand what I mean by that? But you, you've got to get going. Get involved doing something. And begin to pray that prayer. Father, I want to know. Thank you for giving me understanding that I would know what is the hope of your calling in my life. What have you called me to do? Someone described the calling as God's avenue for the manifestation of your giftedness. Whatever God's called you to do, He's gifted you to complete it. You've got the gifts in there. Now, the thing about the gift of God, Paul told Timothy, stir it up. You can have a gift and it lie dormant on the inside of you. I'm convinced there's Christians that live, a, live life on this earth and uh, they're good folks. They die, they go to heaven, but they never tapped into that gift. And we are going to stand before the Lord one day to give an account of what we did in our flesh. Not to get into heaven, you're already there. It's after that, what did you do with what, the gifts I gave you? So, ability. Develop your abilities, whatever they are. If you are, if you are uh, you know, if you're doing design, learn, learn it better. If you're doing, you know, whatever it is. Now, you don't have to be gifted or called to help stack chairs. Just let me bring that out because I just, I've had, we were moving tables one time. And chairs are, you know, at a, a church, I was associate pastor, that we had to stack all the chairs had about 250 of them set up. We're, gonna, we're just stacking chairs. Had a guy tell me, that's not my gifting, brother. <laughs> to stack chairs? Oh, no, I'm not called to stack chairs. And I told him, he was on the worship team. I said, you want to be called to be on, because I was in charge, I was the leader of the worship team. I said, do you want to you wanna be, be called to sing with the worship team? Oh, yes, brother. I said, then you, go, you better stack some chairs. <laughs> And this dude, now listen, this dude, this dude did construction. He painted houses, did all kinds of things. He was able. He says, well, I wasn't called. I have not called to do that. Come on now. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to give you, I'll call you for sure. <laughs> Don't call us, we'll call you, you know. 
But, you know, there are, there's things that you have to be, God's going to gift you to do. Well, how does that develop? Well, stir it up. Stir it up. Get active doing something. Pray over it. Pray over it. And you know what the thing about that? Other people will see. Especially leaders will see. Okay, I can see they've got something here. Okay? And then you can start that process. Reverence God. Be a person of the Word and be a person of your Word. Okay? When we were... <laughs> We were associate pastors at one church, and my wife was over the children's department, because that's her area. She's got a master's in uh, uh, education. She was over our children's department. We had service Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. She went 18 months, 18 months, that's a year and a half, folks, where every service someone called in right then and said, I can't be there, I'm not coming. Every service for 18 months. And see, you, got to try, you, tried to, you, you try to teach people and help them develop out of that, but it was a, that, in that church, that was something that was common. People just, they, they would not be faithful to their commitment. I'm not talking about, hey, I'm going to be gone next week. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about either didn't show up when they were scheduled or called at the last minute and said, I can't come. Okay? That's not right. You see, we ought not have that testimony as Christians at all. And then hating covetousness. Hating coaches. I've had people try to sway my, you know, sway my decisions. They've taken us out to eat. They've done this. They've done that. They've, you know, give you little cards with money in it, which is all, you know, praise the Lord. But I'm just saying, none of it. You cannot let anything. All right. It's not. And there's nothing wrong with doing nice stuff for people. So if we're to hate covetous, that means also that I, I hate bribes. I'm not going to try to bribe anybody to do anything. If I'm going to hate it from this standpoint, then I've got to look at it from that standpoint too. Then what happened was, and, that, and if we're not going back there, but he, they, they found these people, they put them in place. And in Deuteronomy chapter 1, Moses recounts it. He said, I came to you and told you I can't do this anymore by myself. Like, you know, he got it. <laughs> Jethro told him. <laughs> he doesn't mention his father-in-law in Deuteronomy 1. He says, I told look out, for, look out and find these people. You found them, you brought them to me. And it's worked. You, you all know and testify how that's worked out. It's worked out good for us all. It's helped us all. We've come to this place. Now, Jethro told him, if you don't do it, you're going to wear out and you're going to wear the people out. Yeah. All right? So that's why, you know, if you, if, you know, as you get in charge in different places like that, it, that's a great business thing to learn. It's a great thing to learn. It's a great leadership principle from that standpoint. But let's look at it from our standpoint. Let's get ready. No one has to, you know, no one, well, no one recognizes me yet. That doesn't matter. Still get ready. Well, I, they don't want me, you know, I can't, I, I don't really find a place that I can fit. Get ready. Doesn't matter. You get ready. All right? The devil wants you to become complacent. He wants you to be passive. Don't do anything. Just sit there, you know, and whatever, you know, and sing with Doris Day, K, Sarah, Sarah, whatever will be, will be. You know, that's not biblical, folks. Get busy doing something. What, what? Work on yourself. Work on yourself. Now, I found this out. The more I work on me, the less I am concerned about others as far as, well, how come they're not doing this, you know? Because I'm busy with me. All right? Get ready. Moses needs help. Okay? You see, you guys, I'm gonna, as a church, you want to move out of, this, out of this room and move over there into that gymnasium and fill that one up and then finally you don't have to do whatever, maybe the just, city just gives you this whole place, who knows. You know, but if you want to get there, then you're, it's going to be you. It's not going to be the pastor, because Moses couldn't do it by himself alone. And, that, and your pastor, they can't do it by themselves alone. All right? We all have to do it together. We all have to do it together. And uh, Pastor Hagen says all the time, I can't do, I can't do this all by myself. I have to have help. And you have to have good, qualified help. So that, how do we do that? Well, we take the gifts God's given us, we work them, we develop them, we study. You know, there's a lot of times I'll, I, I, I've got online. I was never a dean of a school before. I got online. I studied what other people wrote about it. I looked at it, trying to, and I asked a lot of questions and did that, you know. Do you make mistakes? Well, yes, you make mistakes, but you learn from them and you go on. I found this out. I don't ever, if you ever fall down, don't ever stay down. Just get back up. Because God, God's waiting. He's got the hand to hold you up. When Peter started to sink, Jesus reached out and grabbed him. He didn't say, well, Peter, 
you know. And Peter probably could have swam, you know, a little bit, but he didn't. He didn't yell at Peter for sinking any, did he? No. He's walked by. Had, the rest of the disciples, they sure didn't say anything because they didn't. They weren't out there on the water either, you know. Except for Thomas, I doubt I could ever walk on the water. But anyway, <laughs> let me pray for you, Father. I thank you for these men and women whom you've called to Faith of Victory Church, Lord. I thank you, Father God, for them and the gifts and callings that are resident within them. Each of them, Father, has a place in this local body, just as we all have a place in the universal body of Christ. So, Father, I ask that you would open the eyes of their understanding, that they would know what is that hope. What, what's the confident expectation with joy and gladness that you have concerning what you've called them to do and that the gifts you've given them, you develop them by your Spirit. And Father, we thank you that in meekness and lowliness and humbleness we'll, we'll all pursue what you've called us to do and we'll all take our place in this, what I believe, Father, is this last day gathering in of souls into the kingdom of God. Yes, revive us but do it so that we can win the lost. And Father, we can populate heaven and plunder hell. Father, we give you all the praise and all the glory, Father, in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or Using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.